nine months after the start of the war, opinion polls held in Russia suggest that people still support it. All major pollsters, both Kremlin-affiliated and independent, such as Levada Center, show support for the war to be at around 70-80% approval. The latest Levada Center poll from late October suggests that 44% definitely support the war and 29% likely support it. These are high numbers, and they have changed very little throughout the war, as if nothing can affect the Russian people's attitude, neither defeat on the battlefield, nor heavy losses of the Russian military, nor a mobilization that has brought the war to every home and family. But this is really not the case. Support for the war is falling. People are getting tired of it. For example, this is what the publication Medusa writes about focus groups recently conducted by the Kremlin across the country. They show that Russians are not optimistic about their own and their country's future. Their source stressed that these sentiments, according to the respondents of the polls, are not related to the successful Ukrainian counterattack and the subsequent retreat of the Russian army from Kherson. The Kremlin believes that Russians are basically tired of the war. Medusa's source close to the Kremlin, privy to the results of the focus groups, noted that Russians are increasingly questioning the motivations and reasoning behind the war, despite the efforts of state propagandists. What are the issues? Why are they happening? Other studies also suggest that support for the war is falling. According to the independent sociological project Extreme Scan, the maximum level of support was 66% in April but it began to decline from the start of July, dropping to 51% at the end of September when the mobilization was announced. The fact is that the direct question, do you support the war, on which the demonstration of almost unanimous support is based, is deceptive. Firstly, it is too politicized and puts people in a difficult position. People are afraid to answer honestly. The Extreme Scan project conducted an experiment. At first, when asked, do you support the war, people were given two options, yes or no. 70% answered yes. But when a third option was added, rather not say, answers yes declined to 63%. This is already a different picture, isn't it? Secondly, those who confirm they support the war are in reality very different people and their confirmation is based on different grounds. There are those who really believe in this war in its official cause. And then there are those who don't really care. Extreme Scan Project co-founder Alexei Minyayla calls this group cheerleaders. This group is 25 to 30 percent of people. They have no political position and just join the apparent majority. For example, someone who says that Russia must fight until it's victorious, but at the same time says that the government's priority shouldn't be military victory, but saving the economy. Propaganda claims that the vast majority of Russians support Putin and his war. And these 25-30% who are cheerleaders just want to be part of this majority. If you subtract them from the total number of supporters, you are left with those who truly support the war, at the very least declare that they are willing to somehow contribute to it. This is the base of support. The Extreme Scan project put this group at 30-38%, about the same amount as the opponents of the war, so it's effectively a tie and the balance swings towards their position. Support for the war is falling in other polls as well. In early November, the research group Russian Field conducted a street poll in Moscow. In order not to put respondents in an uncomfortable position, the pollsters posed another question. If you could go back in time and reverse the decision to launch the special military operation, would you do it? Throughout the summer, about 30% said that they would. But that number has risen since then. In October, 40% said yes. At the beginning of November, it was 37%. Putin announced mobilization at the end of September, and it clearly affected these numbers, although the pollsters noted that the decline began even earlier. Mobilization has exerted a huge amount of pressure on Russian nation. In the course of just a few days, feelings of anxiety, fear, and uncertainty about the future increased at least twofold. Here is what Denis Volkov, director of the Levada Center, wrote about how Russians felt at the end of September. There has not been such a dramatic unilateral decline in sentiment in three decades of continuous sociological observation, not through the economic crises of recent years, nor the unpopular pension reform, nor recent military losses. None of them have had a comparable effect. This made sense. In Russia, people are used to winning wars on television. The war with Ukraine was no exception. In the summer, people started to forget about it. Then suddenly, war came to everybody's doorstep. 
For hundreds of thousands of men, life suddenly became a dance with death if found, they'd be sent to the battlefield. In Moscow, young men disappeared from the streets. Some hid at acquaintances' houses, some at duchess, some quickly left for Kazakhstan or Georgia. The Kremlin also noticed it. At the end of October, Putin announced the end of mobilization, speaking very clearly on the matter. Второе, ничего дополнительного не планируется. Я, никаких предложений от Минобороны на это счет не поступало. И, и, и в обозримом будущем я что-то не, не вижу никакой необходимости. Вот, что на войсках-формирователях 222 тысячи человек мобилизованных из, из 300 тысяч. Думаю, что в течение... Ну, примерно в течение двух недель все мобилизационные мероприятия будут завершены. So people count down. Here's a fresh chart from the Public Opinion Foundation poster. At the end of September, anxiety jumped up to 70%, then began to decline, and then fell to 49% after Putin's speech. This is still a higher level than it was before mobilization, but not by much. The war shook up the nation and then let it go. People restarted their usual everyday lives. The war came close, people got very tense, then it became distant, and people relaxed again. This is what Denis Volkov writes on the matter. You could say that, by and large, our society has accepted the mobilization. The anxiety began to subside little by little, not least of all because the authorities were quick to announce the end of the mobilization campaign. Many are probably relieved. The storm clouds have cleared. This is not support for the war, this is how people adapt to the war. People either want to believe or even truly believe in the official message that Russia did not invade Ukraine, but the West wants to destroy Russia, or they simply don't think about it at all. They do not care. They do not care that it's on their behalf that the state is killing innocent people and destroying a neighboring country. There is a common understanding that it is Russia's imperial psychology and history that have made this war possible. Indeed, for more than two decades now, Putin and his propaganda have been fueling Russian nostalgia for imperial grandeur. However, it is this habit of just living for today and not thinking about what is going on around, rather than any imperial syndrome, that has had an impact. One of Russia's leading economists, Natalia Zubarevich, believes that poverty is the cause. A person primarily concerned with survival is generally unempathetic because all their energy is focused on survival. Their world is limited to survival concerns and the preservation of body and social capital, that is inner circle relationships like family and a few friends who can help you get by. This is the cost of the monstrous impoverishment of a large part of the Russian population. 40% of Russians have a lower income than the average resident in Soviet Russia in 1991. To a large extent, Russia is a poor country. It behaves like a poor country. I take care of myself and my inner circle. Everything else is not my concern. Of course, poverty is an important factor. However, polls show that the higher a person's income, the more likely he or she is to support the war. For example, in that Russian field study, when asked the same question about whether they would go back in time and reverse the decision to go to war if they could, the poorest respondents answered with a yes twice as often as the richest, 58% and 29% respectively. It's clear why. The poor are much more afraid that they won't be able to feed themselves. They are primarily concerned with their own survival and everyday life and little else. So it's not just about the poverty itself. What matters is that people feel utterly helpless. They don't believe that they can bring any kind of change or somehow influence the decisions of the state. And if they don't, then what is the point of worrying? These are the same conclusions sources close to the Kremlin are relaying to Medusa. Nothing makes us feel alive. Nothing is driving us forward. Just leave us alone. Stay out of our way. The last time Russia lost a war was 25 years ago. That was the first war in Chechnya. Now there are greater losses, more tension, more despair. People are tired of this terrible and senseless war, but they're used to it. The fatigue is only growing, and people would like this war to end, but they don't believe they can make it happen.